Hello. I'm decided to keep this train going and dive back into my funny red yard business. It's basically, I'm just going to get into it here. This is, I'm still not quite finished with what I want to do with red yard. I'm continuing from this it's page 95 of this book right now. The result is that man can be educated into perceiving significances. Ethical compulsion based on fear leads to evil. Aesthetical education based on the perception of coherent and significant relationship destroys the dark fantasy which evil is. It makes all living and aesthetic activity a creative activity. And this is the kind of the problem, the kind of basic tension that I find because there's this message that I've been noticing a lot that says that the problem to do with fascism involves an aesthetic, aesthetic sorry, the asceticism of politics, turning politics into ascetic activity, and that you can see how the Nazis did this. They had high, even their uniforms. They had like Hugo Boss uniforms, and there it's all highly charged, artistic, ascetic things going into the end. But the thing is, you can also kind of make the same argument for communism as well. That maybe the communists were doing some of that with their own propaganda and stuff like that. But there's this kind of issue in the political sphere that people don't want to asceticize politics. And then, but I've also noticed recently this idea that maybe it's better to keep like if I was to do an astrology business it would be better to try to be apolitical in the sense to have an open business to deal with all sorts of clients and stuff like that and if that and it, to be honest that's one of the main I think issues that I've ran into in terms of developing career is that the, there's a certain I have clashes with people who have different political beliefs and stuff like this perhaps and that if I was maybe more open to working with other people maybe I would you know and and <laughs> I'd be able to be you know have more of a career thing going right but I and my actual my if the, the actual I'm not going to talk too much about my clients because it's private but I mean I've I've worked with all sorts of clients before it does I don't I don't don't actually discriminate but I, the thing is it does sometimes like I can't go you can't um Whatever. You can't just look away in a way. You know what I mean? You can't just close your eyes to what's going on in the world and feign some sort of neutrality that is an ideal, but maybe not, <laughs> you know, just anyways. But the, this is anyways addressing the new age issue of the neutrality. Um, it destroys or should destroy all valuations based on past judgments and the compulsion of tradition, which is this is the big thing is that right now we're having a revival of traditionalism and that if in the kind of the Dane Rudyar perspective where for him, this whole thing about like people blaming the postmodernists for deconstructing everything now, we can't have our traditions and everything or whatever. Like in terms of Rudyar's point of view that any, any of these traditional formulations are basically like to keep going with what he's saying um the compulsion of tradition is these are hindrances to the full living of wholeness in the moment that and if you go to people like uh jiddu krishnamurti that he would often he's very spiritual but very anti-tradition because he's saying that if you're a completely realized being what the hell do you need a tra tradition for that you're awake live your awake life <laughs> and any any move back to some sort of formulated structure or system is basically like why do you need to do that exactly unless you're f afraid and have no and don't have faith in your own uh capacity to generate your uh whatever right like there's this, there's a certain strain of new age thought that's completely anti-traditional that could see everything of these the, the pearl clutching of that we need to you know m maintain these things that are under attack by modernity. There's a certain new age strain of thought that would completely be unsympathetic to that. Let me just put that part out there, right? Um, whether or not that I'm promoting that, that I'm not necessarily promoting that. I'm just saying that that there's a direction you could go if you wanted to, and that I would read Rudyard kind of like this. Um, The wholeness of the moment is the soul of the moment, and the soul of the moment is your soul and mine, ever new, ever young, ever rooted in significance, ever rooted in the quality which is our own, the great theme which life develops by making it integrate and transfigure into the individual significance that com the completeness of our own ever receding horizon. I had a, that's kind of a bit 
the wholeness, all valuations on past judgments and the compulsion of tradition as these hindrances to the full living of wholeness in the moment. The wholeness of the moment is the soul of the moment. And the soul of the moment is your soul and mine, ever new, ever young, in ever-rooted significance. It's the unborn nature he's talking about, as the Buddhists would say. Um, ever-rooted in the quality which is our own, the great theme into which life develops by making it integrate and transfigure into individual significance, completeness, well, beneath all the facades of the, s the structures of tradition and, and, and convention and conditioning that, you know, he's going for the, the unconditioned, unborn self at the root of all things and in, in such. In a, in a, so, and if we continue to the next page here, he's talking about dream analysis, and he says things like, he starts off with, uh, we, we shall refer later to the relationship with astrology as reformulated the bears on the ascetical attitude of life. We shall particularly see how this attitude invalidates all notions of bad aspects and evil planets, at least in natal astrology. But first, we wish first of all to conclude our brief survey of Jung's analytical psychology by outlining blah, blah, blah. So he goes into this Jungian stuff for quite a while here. But, um... The, that's what I, that was kind of introduction to finish off. Now I've finished with what I was trying to be doing with these videos with Red Yar. The, what I was thinking is that I, I titled one of these videos, the, the Henry Miller problem. And I feel like instead of just reading some of the, the problematic Henry Miller stuff there, I would like to, to try to do justice to Henry Miller of why he's worth incorporating. Well, there's, it's kind of funny cause I, one of my friends, introduced me to Henry Miller years ago and it was a female friend and she specifically said that there was this one thing called the wisdom of the heart and I got the end of the book but she's it was actually just a short piece of writing called the wisdom of the heart and it was funny because it would be like for for apparently being a popular piece of writing how difficult it has been to find this piece of writing and I've always had it in my you go to a bookstore and look for it and they don't have it and you try to place an order and they don't have and then it's out of print or something and then you know you try to get it on Amazon they don't have it's like it was weird how hard to find this book was so it was kind of interesting to finally find wisdom of the heart because that was the initial recommendation and um you know the, and then there's all this other stuff with Nanias Nin and um, whatever, the whole, you, all that stuff. I think it's, other side, aside from that one friend though, at the same time, there was like, I had a girlfriend and my my girlfriend had lots of guy friends that I had, I don't think it was, sometimes it would be like you had to put up with your girlfriend's guy friends and not be in, not be too suspicious. But then the, the, the guy friends would generously give me lots of Henry Miller books and stuff like that. And so I, so it's like, okay, well, we're maybe, you know, we're just uh, <laughs> on the same level or something. So, um. I got a bunch of Henry Miller books that, that way of, uh, you know, perhaps competitive male interests, uh, you know, appeasing me with Henry Miller books. Um, but anyways, uh, so what am I saying here? Um, let's go in. We're going to just read this wisdom of the heart here. <clears throat> oh, the one thing I was going to say, though, is that what the point, though, about Dean Rudyard is that if you look and all the stuff, if you look at Henry Miller, and if you look at this kind of point of being there's no good or no bad, it's just the, the dynamic of the chart working itself out. But if you look at Henry Miller, the specifics that I'm kind of looking at is that, then also no offense to people who have similar placements. If you have similar placements to this, let me know. But this is a, it's also generational because we're talking about the generational other planets. That Uranus, he's got Uranus together in a triple conjunction with Mars as well as his moon so Mars and Uranus and the moon conjunct is a pretty gnarly combination and then put that in Scorpio yeah okay so if that is okay think about moral neutrality and the moon is in is in fall and it's like a not a good place for the moon to be the Mars is really strong in Scorpio but though but the Mars is kicking Mars is kicking the moon's ass and then you've got Uranus being this rebellious disruptive thing going on and like there's all there's certain number of ways that that archetype can play out, you know, and the moral responsibility, most people would say would be to be like, to play that archetype out in a way that's not destructive to those around you and stuff. But you know, if you read Henry Miller, 
it's like, like this is, there's certain points of Henry Miller where he's pretty much upfront about like I was the worst asshole ever. <laughs> so, but the kind of thing is like his writing is him kind of trying to like you know deal with the him not being a nice guy and stuff like this or whatever, going through these problems. But it's like you're giving me sympathy, that you know. It's not to say you can still. At the end of it, you can it, the whole having that placement doesn't mean that Henry Miller isn't a great guy. But then you have to say, well, what about the actually looking at the deeds that this person does, right? And then there's also I was watching a movie last night about this loosely based off Hannah Arendt, and there's this idea that Hannah Arendt had that in certain there's some, I think it was the context maybe of you know if people there were good people that nonetheless might have been drafted into the Nazis or drafted into the war and even good people might have been instrumental in committing war crimes or something like this. And the idea that, I mean, it would be different than somebody, his own, you know, whatever, libido drives has got them acting recklessly. But the idea that they're trying to, she was made the argument for morality that there are immoral deeds, but the person does not, that a person can still, is not, impinged by whatever deeds they have done is that the person is retains an essential innocence uh even if they've committed the worst crimes and stuff like this right and that is so that's a kind of i don't know that much about hannah arendt but that's an interesting one to consider as well in terms of whatever like what or how we deal with morality and if we're just being morally neutral or are we actually going to deal with the problem about it right um anyways so i'm going to with all of that, just riffing, I'm going to read this um, Wisdom of the Heart. This is from Henry, Henry Miller, and it's not that long, so I should be able to read it. I don't know how much interjecting I'm going to do, but here we go. Hold on. Um, every book by an analyst gives us, in addition to the philosophy underlying his therapeutic, a glimpse into the nature of the analyst's own problem vis-a-vis -vis life. The very fact of writing a book indeed is a recognition on the part of the analyst of the falsity of the patient versus analyst situation. In attempting through the educative method to enlarge his field of influence, the analyst is tactically, tacit, tacitly informing us of his desire to relinquish the unnecessary role of healer which has been thrust upon him. Though, in fact, he repeats every day to his patients the truth that they must heal themselves, actually what happens is that the list of patients grows with terrifying rapidity so that sometimes the healer is obliged to seek another healer himself. Some analysts are just as pitiful and harassed specimens of humanity as the patients who come to them for relief. Many of them have confused the legitimate acceptance of a whole of a role with immolation or vain sacrifice. Instead of exposing the secret of health and balance by example, they elect to adopt the lazier course, usually a disastrous one, of transmitting the secret to their patients. Instead of remaining human, they seek to cure and convert, to become life-giving saviors, only to find in the end that they have crucified themselves. If Christ died on the cross to inculcate the notion of sacrifice, it was to give significance to this inherent law of life, and not to have men follow his example. Crucifixion is the law of life, says Howe, and it's true. But it must not be understood symbolically, not literally. Throughout his books, it is the indirect or oriental way of life which he stresses. And this attitude, it may also be said... Um, he's talking about Graham Howe, though, here, by the way. Um, is that of art. The art of living is based on rhythm. And give and take, ebb and flow, light and dark, life and death. By accepting all the aspects of life, good and bad, right and wrong, yours and mine, the static, the defensive life, which is what most people are cursed with, is converted into a dance. So this is the whole point of the not being locked into this fixed static life, but to see life as a dance where there's more movement going on. But I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a mutable guy, so maybe I'm just biased to this uh, in the first place. But anyways, to get... Um, <laughs> 
the dance of lice, as Havelock Ellis called it. The real function of the dance is metamorphosis. One can dance to sorrow or to joy. One can even dance abstractly, as Helba Hara proved to the world. But the point is that by mere act of dancing, the elements which compose it are transformed. The dance is an end in itself, just like life. The acceptance of the situation, by any situation, brings about a flow, a rhythmic impulse towards self-expression. To relax is, of course, the first thing a dancer has to learn. It is also the first thing a patient has to learn when he confronts the analyst. It is the first thing that anyone has to learn in order to live. It is extremely difficult because it means to surrender, full surrender. Howe's whole point of view is based on this simple yet revolutionary idea of full and unequivocal surrender. It is the religious view of life. The positive acceptance of pain, suffering, defeat, misfortune, and so on. It is the long way round. It has always proved the shortest way after all. It means the assimilation of experience, fulfillment through obedience and discipline, the curved span of time through natural... The curved span of time. Okay, you see where I'm getting this? The curved span of time through natural growth rather than speedy, disastrous shortcut. This And that's what I try as an astrologer, that if, if I have any message, is I see a lot of people who want to live their life with speedy, disaster shortcuts, and it's best to take, as Henry Miller says, the slow way around that goes with the natural growth of life, right? And the problem, I think, there's a certain tension, I think, with Deleuze, is that Deleuze is all, and Deleuze and Guattari are all about the nomadic line of flight, which is inherently very speedy and racy and about flying off into the distance, whereas the, uh, Henry Miller is taking it back to being grounded more in the Eastern philosophy of being, you know, having the discipline and stuff like this, but that, this is one thing that I'm thinking about. I didn't want to be put people off too much by laying it too heavy on the Deleuzian angle with what I'm doing because I think in the end it just is a it you can kind of wrap it back into Henry Miller and bring it back into this thing that kind of resolves the tensions with some of the uh, the different whatever right whether you're progressive or you're conservative or whatever right but anyways I'm going to continue here. Um, This is the path of wisdom and the one that must be taken eventually because all others only lead to it. Few books dealing with wisdom, or shall I say the art of living, are so studded with profundities as the three books. The professional thinker is apt to look at them askance, askance, <laughs> but people don't use this word very much anymore, because of the utter simplicity of the author's statements. Unlike the analyst, the professional thinker seldom enjoys the opportunity of seeing his theories put to the test. With the analyst thinking, it is always vital, as well as the everyday affair. He is being put to the test every moment of his life. In the present case, we are dealing with man, a man for whom writing is a stolen luxury a fact which could be highly instructive to many writers who spend hours trying to squeeze out a thought. Howe looks at the world as it is now this moment. He sees it very much as he would a patient coming to him for treatment. <laughs> the truth is we are sick, he says, and not only that, but we are sick of being sick. In If there is something wrong, he infers, it is not something which can be driven out with a stick or a bayonet. The remedy is metaphysically achieved, not therapeutically. The cure does not lie in finding a cause and rooting it out. It is as if we change the map of life itself by changing our attitude towards it, says Howe. This is pretty, like, this is like, Deleuze, Deleuze kind of goes in a certain direction. This is pretty standard, like, new agey stuff. Self-help to change your life by changing your attitude towards it. So, right? It's not really that. It's not that as, as radical as, you know, whatever. But, um, I can keep going. This is an internal sort of gymnastics, known to all wise men, which lies at the very root of metaphysics. 
Life as we know is conflict, and man being part of life is himself an expression of conflict. He recognizes the fact and accepts it. He is apt, despite the conflict, to know peace and to enjoy it. But to arrive at this end, which is only a beginning, for we haven't begun to live yet. Man has got to learn the doctrine of acceptance, that is, of unconditional surrender, which is love. And here I must say, I think that the author goes beyond any theory of life. This is kind of funny because I'm reading him, writing about another author, and I know I should probably read this other guy, right? But it's, <laughs> like, this, is how, this is how literature goes. Um, uh, I think the author goes beyond any theory of life yet enunciated by the analysts. Here he reveals himself as something more of a healer than a healer. He reveals himself as an artist of life, a man capable of choosing from the most perilous course in the certitude of faith. Faith in life, and let me quickly add, a faith free and flexible, equal to any emergency, and broad enough to include death, as well as other so-called evils. And this, I was trying to say, to incorporate the fact that if you look at Miller as a guy with that moon, Uranus, Mars in Scorpio, and Scorpio, tarot, it's kind of like, like the death card, you know, it's like, to include, like... There's all the so-called evils in life that the surrender that's asked for is not... A, the surrender includes all the so-called evils into the picture. It doesn't cast them out. It doesn't cancel them. It doesn't say that they're politically opposed. It, 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 it's an inclusive thing, right? Um, for in this broad and balanced view of life appears neither the last enemy or the end if the healer has a role, as he points out. It is to play the part of the gynecologist to death, for <laughs> to give birth to death. Uh, for further de delication in the reader might see the Tibetan Book of the Dead. The whole fourth dimensional view of reality, which is how his metaphysic hinges on this understanding of acceptance. The fourth element is time, which is another way, as Goethe so well knew, of saying growth. As a seed grows in the natural course of time, so the world grows, and so it dies, and so it is reborn again. This is the very antithesis of the current notion of progress. See, and this is this is where we can still, even though this is still Deleuze, this Deleuze and Guattari is kind of funny because Deleuze, in a way, Deleuze is talking about capitalism, but Deleuze is talking about capitalism as this sort of line of flight, and he wants to. Deleuze is talking about taking advantage of, in some way, me being anti trying to make money is not, is not, Deleuzean, Deleuze wants you to make money. Why not? You know, like, or, but there's something about the, um, the, the problems of capitalism. What am I talking, trying to say here? Progress, the infinite progress. There's a certain thing of capitalism has infinite progress, but the kind of issue of Deleuzean stuff is that capitalism knows no limit. And so it, in for, it, you, it makes you do the job of working the limit for capitalism. If capitalism says we have an infinite growth and we can have, you know, you can have bananas, you can have blueberries, you can have whatever, all the different, whatever, imported consumer goods from across the world and, and have the Coca-Cola and the beer flowing and just max out and all the stuff. It's like at some point in time, though, when it hits a bump, you can see the, the the industry is still chugging along, but whoever has to take the limit is when all the prices go up, and then they're like, oh, well, okay, I mean, capitalism is an unlimited process, but the limit is you not being able to afford it, right? Or the limit is you <laughs> having to work these hours. Or the limit is the cost of living being ridiculous. But capitalism itself is completely unthreatened by all this stuff because who the like capitalism doesn't care if you don't you don't have a job capitalism care doesn't it doesn't care if you're out in the street capitalism is going to do its thing anyways right it just needs um and if you can you just if you can rip off people's belongings and sell them and that's just capital street capitalism <laughs> basically right like i don't know that's i um, here's my that's kind of the delusion angle of it but progress right progress ends up being kind of destructive because it ends up just breaking everything down to the lowest common denominator of how you can make money if that is in the capitalist system that's what progress is right but if you look at if we try to anchor this more into this the cycle then at least we can see it as a kind of regenerative thing and that it's not like this process that has no 
end that's just rocketing out. Like, like Jeff Bezos thinks he can just go to Mars and, you know, burn off, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Let's just get back to Henry Miller here. This is the very antithesis of the current ocean of progress, in which we are bound up with the evil dragons of will, purpose, goal, and struggle. Or rather, they are not bound up, but unleashed. Progress, according to the Westerner, means a straight line through impenetrable barriers. Like, the, that's the kind of the Deleuzian nomadic line of flight, right? The straight line. Creating difficulties and obstacles all along the line, and thus defeating itself. Or overcoming them and pushing those obstacles onto other people and in a fascistic kind of way that you know, that's the that's kind of the Deleuze problem right um Howe's idea is the oriental one made familiar to us through the art of jujitsu wherein the obstacle itself is made into an aid the method is applicable to what we call disease or death or evil as it is to a bullying adversary the secret of it lies in the recognition that force can be directed as well as feared, more that everything can be converted to good or evil, profit or loss, according to one's attitude. And this, but this is the whole thing. The, the Deleuzian problem with this is that the whole issue of like the, your, your attitude towards life is neutral and the it's, the it's the thing itself in life that... It's not the thing itself, it's the attitude you take to it. This goes all the way back to Stoics. The Stoics said this kind of stuff, right? The thing about, okay, if you want to take the Deleuzean schizoanalysis problem with this, is that it's one thing to say that if it's, you know, if it's kind of a neutral thing where you're dealing with the ups and downs in life, but if you're in a position where, let's say, you're born into a peasant family, right? You Where you, some lord has a cushy life and you have to do all the shitty jobs and that there's no way out of it and that you can be like to say that the to viewing that inequality or viewing your own material circumstances as it's only your attitude because you judge it's only you know picking up shit and doing all the dirty work or whatever is only bad because you judge it to be bad and that living the noble life of a king is only good because we have this we have this artificial dualistic thing that says to to not have to live as a peasant and to live a nice comfortable life is good that we're we're attached to our bodily form and so it's just our own spiritual ignorance that we can't accept our lives as suffering as peasants and that we, <laughs> that it's a sin to expect anything better because we're we're rebelling against this this order which the divine order which puts the king above us and stuff that it's a, like this is the whole postmodern critique right is that it's okay in some level what the whole thing about neutralizing it that there's no good and evil and is uh is uh, yeah sure on one in a certain level that you can do that but you have to understand that 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 the our ideas of religion and and structure are built in such a way where those things are used to control people and have power over them and and since that's the whole marxist critique against religion right and my whole thing is i have to admit i'm not a very big marxist but i'm not I'm not so opposed to Marx and communism that I don't understand this critique to be like, I don't invalidate that critique and I don't see it to be a problem. Right. And that to, you can't to use spiritual ideas to exert power over other people and to asceticize that process as being good is essentially fascist basically. Right. I would argue. And so I am, for me, I really do think, I don't think we need to let, fear of fascism ruin our astrology but i i'm not afraid to call myself an anti-fascist astrologer if that even makes sense or not but like i don't know if i also need to go around wearing an anti-fascist t-shirt trying to get into fights with anybody who's uh looks <laughs> like they might have different views than me right i don't know right but um ah, whatever but this i'm basically breaking it down for you here what where i'm going with all this um Anyways, to keep going with Henry Miller. In this present fearsome state, man can seems to have but one attitude, escape. Wherein he is fixed as in a nightmare. And this is also the Deleuzian thing. Like the Deleuze, like this is the whole thing. Like Henry Miller is kind of resolving this problem. And Deleuze is kind of like, 
the blues and guitar attitude is like whatever man just go with the escape <laughs> like, why, why 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 do you have to not escape why can't we just do keep going with this escape thing right um, that's kind of my interpretation of Deleuze and Guattari anyways. Because I'm not sure if it's necessarily like the right way to go, but that's kind of what it feels like compared to where the direction Henry Morello goes with this. Um, uh, okay, whatever. Um, escapism. Um, not only does he refuse to accept his fears, but worse, he fears his fears. Everything seems infinitely worse than it is, says how because we are trying to escape. And that's one thing, though, that I did find helpful was working with stuff like there's Muji, who's a spiritual guy, and he said that fear can't come if you welcome it. That if, like, the whole thing of being averse to the sensation of fear in the first place, if you say fear come on, just give it to me, you know, I'll have all the fear you, you know, just, just lay it on me, I'll experience all the fear in the world, then it kind of has this funny effect where it kind of diffuses the fear because the aversion to it is kind of burns out because the, the whole thing is just created by the turning away from whatever sensation it is, right? Um, so I have to say that there is a certain uh, sense, that, you know, I'm not completely, whatever. Anyway, so um, the with Muji... Everything seems infinitely worse than it is because we are trying to escape. This is the very paradise of neurosis, a glue of fear and anxiety, in which, unless we are willing to rescue ourselves, we may stick forever. To imagine that we are going to be saved by outside intervention, whether in the shape of an analyst, a dictator, a savior, or even God, is sheer folly. There are not enough lifeboats to go around, and anyway, as the author points out, what is needed more than lifeboats is lighthouses. A fuller, clearer vision, not more safety appliances. <laughs> Classic Miller. Many influences of astounding variety have contributed to shape the philosophy of life, which, unlike most philosophies, takes its stance in life and not a system of thought. His view embraces the conflicting worldviews. There is room in it to include all of Whitman, Emerson, Thoreau, as well as Taoism, Zen Buddhism, astrology, occultism, and so forth. There we go. See, astrology's right in there. It is thoroughly a religious view of life it, in that it recognizes the supremacy of the unseen. Emphasis is laid on the dark side of life and on all that which is considered negative, passive, evil, feminine, mysterious, unknowable, war dance closes on this note. There is nothing it is not better to accept, even through it be the expression of our enemy's ill will. There is no progress other than what is, if we could let it be. This idea of let be non-interference of living now in the moment fully with complete faith in the processes of life, which must remain largely unknown to us, is the cardinal aspect of his philosophy. It means evolution versus revolution and involution as well as evolution. It takes cognizance of insanity as well as sleep, dream, and death. It does not seek to eliminate fear and anxiety, but to incorporate them in the whole plexus of man's emotional being. It does not offer a panacea for our ills, or nor a paradise beyond. It recognizes that life's problems are fundamentally insoluble and accepts the fact graciously. It is in this full recognition and acceptance of conflict and paradox that how reconciles wisdom with common sense. In the heart of... The it is humor, gaiety, the sense of play, not morality, but reality. It is lenitive, purgative, healing doctrine based on the open palm rather than the closed fist, on surrender, sacrifice, renunciation, rather than struggle, conquest, idealism. It favors the slow, rhythmic movement of growth rather than the direct method which would attain an imaginary end through speed and force. It is not the end always bound up 
Is not the end always bound up with the means? And so this, it may seem counterproductive to go on and do a YouTube video every day about, and my message that I'm trying to put through is that to favor slow rhythmic movement of growth rather than direct to do it, to just push through with speed. But the, if, the way you do YouTube videos, it kind of demands this, you know. The, the, so in a way what I'm trying to do is to participate in the structure, the, the culture as it is structured and offer a kind of resistance by saying it's kind of ridiculous to do this, is it not? Um, but and yet you are the ones who structured it this way. So, you know, what can we say? We're only working with the system. You know, we're participating and building this as we go. And this is, you know... You're only asking for this. <laughs> oh, so, what were you saying? Um, it seeks to eliminate the doctor as well as the patient by accepting the disease itself rather than the medicine or the mediator. It puts the seed above the bomb, the conversation before solution, conversion before solution, and counsels uniqueness rather than normality. It seems to be generally admitted by intelligent people and even by the unintelligent that we are passing through one of the darkest moments in history. This is because it's the, you know, World War II kind of era, or I don't know, when was this, whatever, it's kind of in that era. What is not so clearly recognized, however, is that man has passed through many such periods before and survived. There are those who content themselves with putting the blame for our condition on the enemy, call the church, the education, the government, fascism, communism, poverty, circumstance, whatnot. They waste their forces proving that they are right and the other fellow wrong. For them, society is largely composed of those who are against their ideas. But, so this is one of the things, though, is that you see, Miller's resolving the political tension between fascism and communism, and that Deleuze likes Henry Miller's, a lot of Henry Miller, but he's like, no, wait, hold on, we can't do this yet. We have to, like, that's the whole po the point of the Deleuzean stuff, is that we're not quite, we're not quite square with that yet, you know, that, and especially if you look at whatever. That's a, that's just the whole delusion thing. Is it kind of it's kind of like the fly in the ointment that you're not you know we're no so sorry we're not and then that could actually be why Parnas doesn't like the uh, the postmodernists because the, the postmodern thing about the postmodernists always trying to stop wholeness right but I mean the thing is you can still say if the point of the whole the silly the silly thing about the Rick Tarnas argument is that at what level are postmodernists really negating wholeness right because I work with a meditation teacher who talks, and she introduced me to Adi Ashanti and stuff like this. And if you listen to Adi Ashanti talk about wholeness, what he says is that wholeness is a kind of a pre-existing thing that is already there, and you don't actually have to do anything to create wholeness. That the only thing that is like making, like that, as they say in all these books, that like there's the ignorance that doesn't see things as being whole that creates not wholeness. So that if anything, like if 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 a, anything a most modernness says destroys wholeness, only if you only if it has that effect on your own psyche by dividing it and so that you'd label as that being as something that's bad that you can't include and that, you know, you're, you have a fractured psyche and that you have to get into arguments with people about it. You know what I mean? It's like, the it's so funny because, like, why, it's the most obvious, it should be the most obvious thing in the world. And so that Deleuze has these issues rather than resolving the political tension between fascism and communism that he's going to do his thing and Henry Miller is going to do his thing but in they're both living in a world and in this one person reaches wholeness it doesn't just because the other person is writing books uh, uh, criticizing uh, with political theory or something like that that, that doesn't you know, like, you don't have to, you would be equivalent to saying we have to put all the people who write about politics and gulags and kill them to achieve our home. And that's basically what the whole Nazi thing is, that they're like, we, oh, we've achieved wholeness, but in order to do that, we have to kill this certain thing that we have, that's our shadow. <laughs> and and then, then we can really do wholeness. Right? And then it's like, no, the weird people saying, no, you don't have to kill all the people that, and then they're like, no, you're the people that are, disagree with us are the ones who don't do get wholeness. You know, it, it's, that's why... That's the whole problem with New Age becoming a weird Nazi thing, right? This is what I'm trying to say. 
Um, anyways, they waste their forces proving that they are right and the other fellow wrong. For them, society is largely composed of those who are against their ideas. But society is composed of the insane and the criminals, as well as the righteous and the unrighteous. Society represents all of us. What we are and how we feel about life, as Howe puts, how, as Howe puts it. Society is sick. Scarcely anybody will deny that. And in the midst of this sick world, we are, hold on, the doctors who, knowing little of the reason why they prescribe for us, having little faith in anything but heroic surgery, and in the patient's quite reasonable ability to recover, the medical men are not interested in health, but in combating sickness and disease. Like the other members of society, they function negatively. Similarly, no statesman arise who appear capable of dealing with the blundering dictators for the quite probable reason that they are themselves dictators at heart. There, here is the picture of our so-called normal world obeying, as Howe calls it, the law of infinite regress. Science carefully measures the seen, but it despises the unseen. Religion subdivides itself, protesting the non-conforming in one negative schism after another, per pursuing the path of infinite regress, while aggressively attaching itself to the altars of efficient organization. Art exploits a multiplication of accurate imitations. Its greatest novelty is surrealism, which prides itself upon its ability to escape all imitations imposed upon sanity by reality. Education is a more or less free-for-all, but the originality of individualism suffers mechanization by the mass-productive methods, and top marks are awarded for aggressive excellence. The Limits of law aggressively insist that the aggressive sh should be aggressively eliminated, thus establishing the right by means of out-wronging the wrongdoer. Our amusements are cad catered for by mechanized methods for which we cannot amuse ourselves. Those who cannot play football themselves enthusiastically shout and boo the gallant but well-paid efforts of others in ardent partisanship. This is also kind of funny because if you that even that whole thing about sports, spectator sports, kind of like there's a delusion thing about how they you've got this kind of indirect connection to the sports team and that you have like all these people making it a kind of a libidinal investment into this collective thing going on and that you can you can you can. You can understand the Luzian take on the collective unconscious in that way. You have a group of people all making an investment into so the same thing, creating a collective, but it's you can you can shape that by deciding where your attachments and where your investments are, right? Um, I don't know, just a riff, a quick idea anyways. Those who can neither run nor take a risk back horses. If you can't get in the game yourself, you back somebody else's horse. Those who cannot take the trouble to tolerate silence have sound brought to their ears without effort, or to go to picture places to enjoy the vicarious advantages of a synthetic cinema version of the culture of our age. He's talking about the society of the spectacle, guys. L read some Guy Debord. Um, <laughs> the system we call normality, and it is to live in this disordered world that we bring up our children so expensively. The system is threatened with disaster, but we have no thought but to hold it up, while we clamor for peace in which to enjoy it. Because we live in it, it seems to be as sacred as ourselves. This is also going back to Rudyard's thing about keeping the castle going, right? Um, the safety of the castle. This way of living as refugees from realism, this vaunted palace of progress and culture, it must never suffer change. And this is what we're, we, we, maybe we've established this because now we're starting to get the feedback loop of a culture which is just locked into, people, nobody knows what, you know, time and place anything comes from anymore. It's all just the, you know, a, a nostalgia loop on repeat, basically, right? Uh, that we don't, 
we're living in this palace just detached from the natural changes of reality, right? And I think astrology, I love astrology because I think astrology has this sort of like lure in it that maybe we can get out of this virtual reality and get back into the actual world where change happens and stuff happens rather than just watching the same movie on repeat over and over and over again, right? But then that's also a kind of a, whatever, we'll get into all that, but... Um, It is normal to be so. Who said so? And what does this word normal mean? Normality, says how, is, is the paradise of escapologists. <laughs> Gavar Mate might like this one. For the, it is the fixation of concept, pure and simple. It is better if we can. He asserts, to stand alone and feel quite normal about our abnormality doing nothing whatever about it, except what needs to be done in order to be oneself. It is just this ability to stand alone and not feel guilty or harassed about it, of which the average person is incapable. The desire for lasting external security is uppermost. Revealing, this is sort of like the attachment versus uh, bonding or whatever, Attachment versus authenticity thing that Gabor Mate talks about. The desire for a lasting external security is uppermost, revealing itself in the endless pursuit of health, happiness, possessions, and so on. Defense of what has been acquired being the obsessive idea, and yet no real defense being possible, because one cannot defend what is undefendable. All that can be defended are imaginary, illusory, protective devices. For who, for example, could feel sorry for St. Francis because he threw away his clothes and took the vow of poverty? He was the first man on record, I imagine, who asked for stones instead of bread. Living on the refuse which others threw away, he acquired the strength to accomplish miracles to inspire a joy such as few men have given the world and by no means the last of its powers to write the most sublime and simple, the, the most eloquent hymn of thanksgiving that we have in all literature. The Canticle to the Sun Let go and let be how urges Being is burning in the truest sense and if there is too be any peace, it will come through being, not having. This is the flip on the Guy Debord's spec Society as the Spectacle, if you can recognize what he's doing, right? This is definitely a situationist reference. We are not all familiar with the phrase, life begins at 40. Does it? <laughs> I'm not even, I never heard that one before, but... Um, for the majority of men it is so, for it is only in the middle age that the continu continuity of life, which death promises, begins to make itself felt and understood. The significance of renunciation, as the author explains it, lies in the fact that it is not a mere passive acquiescence, an ignominious surrender to the inevitable forces of death, but on the contrary, a recounting, a revaluing is this crucial point in the individual's life that the masculine element gives way to the feminine. And this, the thing though, this is the whole thing, because Deleuze, I feel like even what Deleuze is trying to do is the denial of the feminine in this sense. But the thing is, I mean, feminine, it kind of, kind of gets caught up in this gender dualism. But if we take it, if we forget about the feminine and we just call it yin and yang, that if we think of yang stands for the active, you know, production of this and that. And like the problem with the Deleuzean philosophy is that it's all about like production and anti-production. And that, like, that anti-production, any kind of anti-production is necessarily fascistic, it seems, right? But it's sort of, like, in that sense, they're, like, the thing that somebody has to, the sort of whole narrative, like, you know, in order to grow up, you need to make sacrifices. Like, you can't, you know, you can't, 
you gotta let go of the stuff to do what you want. And Deleuze is kind of like, this is all just ideology. You don't have to let go of shit, do what you want, kind of thing. Like, this is kind of like the Deleuze point of view. It's basically questioning all this, that like, the, the, you're just buying into a system that is trying to, sing, selling you this idea of progress, putting a carrot in front of your head, saying you need to go in this direction, and you need to give up all this stuff to do this, and that by doing this, you are turning yourself into a little engine uh, that's pr making money for other people that are profiting off you and they profit immensely off of saying that you can't have all these things which they then get to have because the ideology programs it so they can extra extract that from you, right? Which is basically, unfortunately, the Marxist critique and the Marxist tension against this stuff. And like I say, I'm not even much of a Marxist, but I'm enough of one that I'm not resolved on this quite so easily. Um... But, you know, I mean, there is also the basic fact of life is that you're not going to have your health. You're not going to, you're not, your health is finite. You're going to end up getting sick and dying at some point in time. You're going to, your good looks, your beauty and your, your libido are only there for a short period of time. So there's all these things that you do actually have to get, like, non-attachment is kind of a necessary thing. And you can't just use, you know, you have to incorporate the the understanding of mortality and that you will eventually die and that you know that there's also what i like about i was watching this movie last night that for, called i am not a monster and they also had this idea i think it was a hannah rent idea that you know the, this gf martell also talks about this the idea that the nuclear bomb you know as soon as there's a moment where the whole world could get wiped out by nuclear warfare. And this is the whole thing that I don't want to be doom and gloom about this, about whatever is going on with the Russia and the Ukraine thing, and if that's a risk. I don't. My intention isn't to be doom and gloom or to be fear-mongering and all this kind of stuff. But basically, if you understand the, the, the existential reality that we're faced with, that that could... Always, that is always there as a possibility on the table, as horrific as it is, that if you're living in a world where people are asking you to, to give up all this stuff, to work for somebody, to, to, to profit for, it's like, to, if, if it could all just go up in smoke <laughs> tomorrow, like, what in, what on earth is holding you to these contracts that you have made? <laughs> exactly. You know, that, like, what on earth, like, if you could just, if you only had a certain amount of time to live, and, which is actually, if you think about human life, it's a, the situation we're faced with anyways. We all are, have mortality hanging over our heads anyways. It's only, it's an issue of, okay, we can, of course, extend the human race by reproducing and stuff like this. But the basic thing is, we're, what, it's your life. You only have a limited time to do what, what you want with your life. And the question is, you know, people will say you have to sacrifice this, that you have to, you know, do things a certain way, that you have to, you, you have to fit into a certain mold in order to have some sort of, like, the whole thing is that you have to fold yourself into this thing just so that, you know, you have the, your, your attachment needs are met, or whatever, and that, that's, that, that is used as blackmail to make you into a certain way, and all this kind of stuff. The Deleuzian perspective is to di divest as much, you know, you don't have to divest completely, but divest as much as you can, that, that blackmail doesn't have an effect on you, and you can do what the hell you want. And then, and then when somebody says you have to make a sacrifice to do this and that, then you, you are the one essentially calling the shots on that. But it's like the whole issue though about Saturn, the thing is that the using Saturn essentially is going to ask, is going to put that, what I'm trying to say about limit displacement, there's going to be a limit one way or another. And the ethics is essentially, if you are not, the ethics is if you're taking that limit on yourself, it may be the most ethical thing to do. If you are pushing that, limit onto somebody else that may be ethically inappropriate right but we live in a situation where people where this we're having these limits placed on us all the time right so it's a and uh the the stresses of our life where we're kind of managing the basic thing like affording our dinner affording groceries affording housing that we're not conscious of this at all times but our subconscious is always managing the pressures on us, which are real materialistic pressures, right? That And so the idea that we can ground the unconscious in our material circumstances and it doesn't have to be all about the archetypes of the collective unconscious. And that's the Deleuzian kind of argument. But I mean, I don't, whether that have to do with astrology, I don't know, but I'm th that's what comes up as I'm getting into this, right? But um, the, whatever, I'm kind of just, throwing this stuff together and kind of trying to figure out where I stand on it. 
Um, but the, well, the whole thing, the problem with Deleuze, though, as I'm saying, is that, like, the feminine, which we, let's not call it the feminine, let's just call it yin, or that if Jupiter is about growth and Saturn is about limitation, the whole thing, though, the, the issue that I have about with the people who are taking an anti-fascist ideology is that they would be real. I have this feeling reading some of this stuff that they would be really against this idea that there is a planet that represents limitation that has some sort of metaphysical power to <laughs> to view limitations on you that and that you have and that this thing is somehow superior to your own individual effort to overcome it or something but there's the idea that Jungianism or not well i mean it's not just Jungianism but the whole idea of alchemy and all this is that that the the lead into gold the limitation is the lead and the gold is the uh enlightenment that the 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 the, the, the ideal of philosophical enlightenment in the um the renaissance and stuff like that aspires to is achieving the gold of insight and stuff like this right so and that necessarily integ integrates the obstacle and develops science and technology and understanding out of it right um, and that's that's the aim of the that Saturn can be a liberating thing if to understand it correctly, I suppose, rather than just being a limitation, right? I hope maybe I don't know. I'm 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 playing with it, anyways. Um, or is that too kitsch? Or is it too neutralizing? Or does it not appreciate the negative of Saturn, right? Um, I'm just gonna keep going though. Um, like how? Uh, God, this is gonna take a lot longer than I thought. Well, how much time is it? It's 10. Okay, I can find enough time. It is crucial. It is, it is at this crucial point that in the individual's life that the masculine element gives way to the feminine. This is the usual course with nature herself seems to be taken care of, which, which nature seems to take care of. For the awakened individual, however, life begins now, at any and every moment. It begins at the moment when he realizes that he is part of a great whole and in the, the relationship... In the, in the realization becomes himself whole. In the knowledge of limits and relationships, he discovers the eternal self, thenceforth to move with obedience and discipline and full freedom. Balance, discipline, and illumination, these are the key words in Howe's doctrine of wholeness or holiness. For the words mean the same thing. It's not necessarily new, but it needs to be rediscovered by each and every one individually. As I said before, one meets in such poets and thinkers as Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman, to take a few recent examples. It is a philosophy of life which nourished the Chinese for thousands of years, a philosophy which, unfortunately, they have abandoned under Western influence. I don't know if that's right or not, but that's what helped Miller's take on it. Um, that is that this ancient wisdom of life should be reaffirmed by practicing analyst by healer seems to me altogether logical and just what greater temptation is there for the healer than to play the role of god and who knows better than he the nature and wisdom of god e graham howe is a man of his prime healthy normal in the abnormal sense successful as the world goes and desirous more than anything else of leading his own life he knows that the healer is primarily an artist and not a magician or a god. He seeks, by expressing his views publicly, to wean the public of a dependency which is itself an expression of disease. He is not interested in healing, but in being. This is also, this is my main issue that I have a, like, why I'm doing this, why I'm spending an hour reading Rudine Rudier and 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 Miller and then bringing up to Liz Martin like this this stuff about like that this attitude that the healer is a primarily an artist not a magician or a god and he seeks by expressing his views publicly to wean blah 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 he's not interested in healing but in being like this whole thing that like there's 
I honestly think the people that are really invested in healing are the ones that don't heal and that it's better to just be and then if healing happens, it's a byproduct, right? I mean, I don't even know. I'm not saying it's like, like healing won't happen. It doesn't happen. But the preoccupation with healing is part of the problem. And that's part. And I, I honestly am suspicious of a lot of this emphasis on like therapy culture about like trying to say that the solution to everything is that everybody just needs to go to therapy. Like I, I, and although maybe, I don't know, this is an out of date point of view because I read too much Henry Miller, but that's kind of my attitude, it's, which is Miller inspired. Um, not to say that they're, I mean, it's not absolutist either because I've, I've done some therapy stuff and I, I'm open to doing more therapy stuff, but I'm, I'm suspicious of how, uniformly people just think of it as like a magic bullet silver bullet or that's the all we need to do is just convince more people to go to therapy and then yeah okay then and then what <laughs> and then what do you do right what do you do after that that's the real question um he does not seek to cure but to enjoy a life more abundant he is not struggling to eliminate disease but to accept it and by devouring it incorporate it into the body of light and health, which is man's true heritage. He's not overburdened because his philosophy of health would not permit him to assume tasks beyond his powers, right? That's the main thing is that like in to have a philosophy of health that you don't burn yourself out. And that's the main thing about Gabor Mate, the myth of normal, and also Byung Chul Ham's The Burnout Society is that to, to, if you're starting from a point of health, then you don't get sick. It's a, you know, you don't get sick in the first place if you're coming from a healthy position. And that if I, I if I seem like a kind of person who's sort of like prickly and hard to deal with is that often I just get frustrated because I find that it's like people are just trying to pull me into this toxic kind of way of living, right? Um, he takes everything in his stride with measure and balance, consuming only what he can digest and assimilate of experience. He, he, if he is very a very capable analyst, as he generally admitted, even by his detractors, it is not because of what he knows, but because of what he is. He is constantly un, up, unloading himself of his excess baggage, be it from the form of patients, friends, admirers, or possessions. His mind is, as the Chinese say, alive and empty. It is, he is anchored in the flux, neither drowned in it nor vainly trying to damn it. He is a very wise man, who is at peace with himself and the world. He, one knows that instantly merely by shaking hands with him. There is no need, he says in concluding War Dance, to be morbid about the difficulty in which we find ourselves, for there is no undue difficulty about it. If we will but realize that we bring the difficulty upon ourselves by trying to alter the inevitable... The little man is so afraid of being overwhelmed, but the larger man hopes for it. The little man refuses to swallow so much of his experience regarding it as evil, but the larger man takes it as his everyday diet, keeping the open pipe and open house for every enemy to pass through. The little man is terrified lest he should slip from light into darkness, from seen into unseen. But the larger man realizes that it is but sleep or death, and either is the very practice of his recreation. The little man depends upon goods or golf for his well-being, seeking for doctors or other saviors, but the larger man knows that by deeper process of his inward conviction that truth is paradox and that he is safest when he is least defended. The war of life is one thing, man's war is another. Being war about war, war against war, and an infinite regress of offensive and defensive argument. It may seem from the citations that I favor War Dance above the two other two books, but it is not the case, perhaps. The, uh, the daily threat of war, I was led instinctively to make reference to this book, which is really about peace. The three books are equally valuable and represent different facets of the same homely philosophy, which is not, let me repeat, system of thought expounded and defended in brilliant fashion, but a wisdom of life that increments life. There's no other purpose than to make life more lifelike, strange as that may sound.
Whoever has dipped into the esoteric lore of the East must recognize that the attitude towards life set forth in these books is but a rediscovery of the doctrine of the heart. The element of time, so fundamental in house philosophy, is a restatement in scientific language of the esoteric view that one cannot travel on the path before one has become the path himself. Never, perhaps, in historic times has man been further off the path than at this moment. At an age of darkness, it has been called a transitional period involving disaster and enlightenment. Howe is not alone in thus summarizing our epoch. It is the opinion of earnest men everywhere. It might be regarded as an equinoctial solstice of the soul, the furthest outward reach that can be made without complete disintegration. It is the moment when the earth to use another analogy, before making the swing back, seems to stand stock still. There is an illusion of end, a stasis seemingly like death, but it is only an illusion. Everything at this crucial point lies in the attitude which we assume toward the moment. If we journey it as death, we may be reborn and continue our cyclical journey. If we regard it as an end, we are doomed. It is no accident that the various death philosophies with which we are familiar should arise at this time. We are the parting of the ways, able to look forwards and backwards with infinite hope or despair. For Nor is it strange either that so many varied expressions of a fourth dimensional view of life should now make their appearance. The negative view of life, which is really the death-like view of things, summed up by Howell in the phase infinite regress, is gradually giving way to a positive view, which is multidimensional. Wherever the fourth dimensional view is grasped in multiple dimensions, open up. The fourth is the symbolic dimension, which opens the horizon in infinite egress. With it, time and space takes on a wholly new character. Every aspect of life is henceforth transmuted. In the dying, the seed re-experiences the miracle of life, but in a fashion far beyond the comprehension of the individual organism. The terror of death is more than a compensated for by the unknown joys of birth. It is precisely the difference, in my opinion, between the eye and the heart doctrines. For, as we all know, in expanding the field of knowledge, we but increase the horizon of ignorance. Life is not in the form, but in the flame, says Howe. For the 2,000 years, despite the real wisdom of Christ's teachings, we have been trying to live in the mold, trying to wrestle wisdom from knowledge instead of wooing it, trying to conquer over nature instead of accepting and living by her laws. It is not at all strange, therefore, that the analyst, whose hands the sick, whose hands the sick and weary are now giving themselves like sheep to the slaughter, finds it necessary to reinstate the metaphysical view of life. Since Thomas Aquinas, there has been no metaphysics. The cure lies with the patient, not the analyst. We are chained to one another by invisible links, and it is by the weakest in whom our strength is revealed or registered. Poetry must be made by all, said Lautremont, and so too must all real progress. We must grow wise together, else all is vain and illusory. If we are in a dilemma, it is better that we stand still and face the issue rather than resort to hasty and heroic action. And this is what, oh my God, if I could, if I could somehow just impart this message on so many people I've seen that are not able to do this. Oh well. To live in truth, which is suspense, says how, is adventure, growth, uncertainty, risk, and danger. Yet there is little opportunity in life today for experiencing that adventure unless we go to war. Meaning thereby that by evading our real problems from day to day, we have produced a schism on the one side of which is the illusory life of comfortable security and, a pain, and painlessness, and on the other disease, catastrophe, war, and so forth. The division, the duality, or whatever, right? Um, we are going through hell now, but it should be excellent would be excellent if it really if it really were hell and if we really go through with it 
So it's like this whole thing of this Bros Bresney shit about like, um, you know, astrology is just going to be completely neutral. Nor I don't know, like maybe I'm misinterpreting it, but it's trying to neutralize anything. Miller says that if it's going to be hell, we might as well really go through hell, you know, really, you know, really do it rather than just be like, oh, I'm just pretending it's not hell, right? Because that makes me feel more comfortable. Um, we cannot possibly hope unless we are thoroughly neurotic to escape the consequences of our foolish behavior in the past. Those who are trying to put the onus of responsibility for dangers which might threaten on the shoulders of these dictators might well examine their own hearts and see whether their allegiance is really free or a mere attachment to some other form of authority possibly unrecognized. Attachment to any system, whether psychological or otherwise, is how, is suggestive of anxious escape from life. Those who are preaching revolution are also defenders of the status quo, their status, their status quo. Any solution to the world's ills must embrace all mankind. We have got to relinquish our precious theories, our buttresses and supports, to say nothing about our defenses and possessions. We have got to become more inclusive, not more exclusive. You hear this stuff a lot, actually. This is pretty, like, this is pretty common, you know, as this has become the common rhetoric a lot of the time, right? But I don't know. Okay. What is not acknowledged and assimilated through experience piles up in the form of guilt and creates a real hell, a literal meaning of which there, where the unburnt must be burnt. A doctrine of the reincarnation includes this vital truth. We, we in the West scoff at this idea, but we are nonetheless victims of this law. Indeed, if one were tried to give a graphic description of this place condition, what more accurate illustration would be summoned than the picture of the world we now have on our hands? The realism of the West it is, not negate, is it not negated by reality. The word has gone over to its opposite, which is the case with so many of our words. We are trying to live only in the light, with the result that we are enveloped in darkness. We are constantly fighting for the right and the good, but everywhere we see evil and injustice. As Howe rightly says, if we have our ideals achieved and gratified, they are not ideals at all, but fantasies. If we need to open up, to relax, to give way, to obey the deeper laws of our being in order to find a true discipline... Discipline, how it defines as the art and acceptance of the negative. It is based on the recognition of the duality of life, of the relative rather than the absolute. Discipline permits a free flow of energy. It, it gives absolute freedom within relative limits. One develops despite circumstances, not because of them. This was a life wisdom known to Eastern peoples handed down to us in many guises, not least of which is the significant study of symbols known as astrology. Oh yes. Okay. One hour and 12 minutes. And I've got, well, I actually already talked about astrology in this once, but now I've got two mentions of astrology in the same text. Um, sorry for making such a long video. Hopefully you guys like this. Um, here, so you see, now we're really talking about Henry Miller astrology. Here, time and growth are vital elements to the understanding of reality. Properly understood, there are no good or bad horoscopes. See, getting this from Rudyard, being the one who's doing his horoscopes. Nor good or bad aspects. There is no moral or ethical examination of men or things. Only a desire to get at the significance of the forces within and without and their relationship. An attempt, in short, to arrive at a total grasp of the universe and thus keep man anchored in the moving stream of life which embraces known and unknown any and every movement from this viewpoint is therefore good or right and the best for whomever whoever it may be for on how one orients himself to the moment depends on the failure or the fruitfulness of it but that is also that sounds like it's attachment to outcome though oh whatever um we'll keep going in a very real sense, we can see today how man is really dislocated himself from the movement of life. He is somewhere on the periphery, whirling like a whirly gig, going faster and faster and blinder and blinder. Unless he can make the gesture of surrender, unless 
he can let the iron will, which is merely an expression of his negation of life, he will never get back to the center and find his true being. It is not only the dictators who are possessed, but the whole world of men everywhere. We are in the grip of demonic forces created by our own fear and ignorance. We say no to everything instinctively. Our very instincts are perverted so that the word itself has come to lose all sense. The whole man acts not instinctually, but intuitively because his wishes are as much one with the law as he is himself. But to act intuitively, one must obey the deeper law of love, which is based on absolute tolerance, the law which suffers and permits things at, to be as they are. Real love is never perplexed, never qualifies, never rejects, never demands. It replenishes by grace of restoring unlimited circulation. It burns because it knows the true meaning of sacrifice. It is life illuminated. The idea of unlimited circulation, not only the necessities of life, but of everything, is if there be such a thing, the magic behind house philosophy, it is the practical way of life, though seemingly impractical. How, whether it be admitted or not, there are hierarchies of being as well as of role. The highest types of men have always been those in favor of unlimited circulation. And this is sort of like, you can bring a Deleuzian thing in here if you wanted to, but maybe I'll just, I'll just keep reading so rather than getting bogged down in that. There, but you know, the circulation, right? The flows and blocks and, you know, it's the, whatever. They were comparatively fearless, but sought neither riches nor security except in themselves, in their, in their body without organs, right? From a Deleuzian <laughs> point of view. Uh, by abandoning all they most cherished, they found the way to a larger life. Again, then where are your libidinal investments? Their example still inspires us, though we follow them more with the eye than not with the heart, if we follow them at all. They never attempted to lead, but only to guide. The real leader has no need to lead. He is content to point the way. Unless we become our own leaders, content to be what we are in the process of becoming, we shall always be servitors and idolaters. We have only what we merit. We would have infinitely more if we wanted less. The, this is the whole thing of like... Uh, like I, the the tension between Deleuze and mysticism is basically the riches of not wanting versus the Nietzschean thing about how that's just a strategy to, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth or that you really want the thing, but you're creating this artificial not wanting it to create a false sense of superiority. That's the Nietzschean point of view. Or else there is the, the Christian thing is just that you can be happy with not desiring stuff or that you can... Which is also the Buddhist point of view, which is also the mystical, you know, to, to try to create a sense of non-desire and a non-chasing, which is in a sense, and the thing is, it's kind of different though, because it's like, that can be anti-capitalist, but Deleuze is kind of like, well, you can also just use this, try to creatively work with this thing to actually get what you want and get some satisfaction out of life, you know, it was coming from more of a therapeutic point of view, right? And that, but maybe we can see these two things as the masculine and the feminine, right? Rather than seeing them as being, you know, production and, or you can see these two forces to be balanced out and integrated, right? I'm, anyways, I'm almost done here. Their example still inspires us, that though we follow them more with the eye than with the heart, if we follow it at all, they never attempted to lead, but only to guide, blah, 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 where am I going? Ooh, unless we become our own leaders content to be what we are in the process of becoming, we always we shall always be servitors and idolaters. We have only what we merit. We would have infinitely more if we wanted less. The whole secret of salvation hinges on the conversion of word to deed with and through the whole being. It is this turning and wholeness and faith conversion, the spiritual sense, which is the mystical dynamic of the fourth dimensional view. I used the word salvation a moment ago, but salvation like fear or death, when it is accepted and experienced is no longer salvation. There is no salvation really, only infinite realms of experience proving more and more tests, demanding more and more faith. And that's the whole thing, what I'm trying to say about the whole progress thing 
is that of trying to thinking if you think that this stuff is going to give you solve everything like this is what he says at the end here there is no salvation only infinite realms of experience with more and more tests so that if we resolve all the problems like we're just gonna like we're gonna pretend we're gonna resolve that there's no political tension that there's no tension and we're just gonna no good and evil all you're gonna do is just run into another test where you're gonna have to do that again, you know? And then you're gonna, okay, we resolve that one and then just gonna throw more and more things. And then you're like, until it's something really, ex I don't know, that's that's kind of my, my criticism of this, but it doesn't actually give you any salvation, really. <laughs> um, Willy nilly, we, and that's also the Deleuzian thing. It's like there's an infinite debt. There's an infinite, once you realize that you're like, you're not getting the, the, you're, the, release that you really want you're just getting infinite you just i don't unless the, or what, what the audio shanti thing is that the wholeness is already here you're not getting anything that's not already here already right so whatever is and as trium strunkba says it's the the, the ultimate disappointment <laughs> is enlightenment <laughs> that we realize you're not getting what you want um There is no salvation, only infinite realms of experience providing more and more tests, demanding more and more faith. Willy-nilly are we moving towards the unknown, and then sooner and readier we give ourselves up to the experience, the better it will be for us. This very word, which is so infrequently on our lips today, transition, indicates increasing awareness as well as apprehension. To become more aware is to sleep more soundly, to cease twitching and tossing. It is only when we get beyond fantasy, beyond wishing and dreaming, that the real conversion takes place and we can awake reborn. The dream become, re-becomes reality. For reality is the goal. Deny it how we will. And we can approach it only by an ever-expanding consciousness, by burning more and more brightly, even until even memory itself vanishes. Hmm interesting well that's it i finished reading it you guys yeah okay hopefully you enjoyed that i'm gonna take a break now